Business Matters is brought to you in part by Lion Burger Construction and Berglund Center, where live entertainment lives in the Roanoke Valley. Hello and welcome to Business Matters, a program on Blue Ridge PBS that strives to explore that subject from a variety of viewpoints and scenarios featuring interviews with the people helping to grow jobs, the economy, and the Blue Ridge region because business matters. I'm Gene Morano. My guest on today's show is Lisa Garcia, appointed director of the Ramp Business Accelerator in July. Lisa is also the vice president of entrepreneurial development. We'll catch up on the latest happenings at Ramp and with Verge, the umbrella organization that also includes the Roanoke Blacksburg Technology Council. Lisa, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. You're a busy person, huh? Yeah, we're, we are so busy. So much happening. Now, you succeeded Mary Miller. I did. We had on the show before she retired as the, the founding director, I guess. Absolutely. Of RAMP. And did she, she leave things in pretty good shape? She did. Oh, my goodness. We would not be where we are today without Mary Miller. Uh, as, as everybody knows in this kind of work, the first dollars, the first customers are the hardest ones to get. And Mary did that hard, hard work. Mm -hmm. So at this point is RAMP, uh, the Regional Acceleration and Mentoring Program, are you able to, are you tracking the early cohorts, Lisa, oh, that came through? And how are they doing? They're doing really well. So um, we have at this point, after five years, about 33 companies that we've worked with over the years, over those five years. Mm -hmm. um, I've been involved with RAMP as an instructor and a coach for four of those five years. And... Um, Percentage-wise, I can't name off the top of my head uh, how many of those companies are still in business, but the vast majority are, um, as is the case with many startups. They sometimes pivot to other um, venues. They may, may go out of business altogether. We have one um, entrepreneur in the region who dropped the one business that she was doing, started another one, and is wildly successful. And she said she couldn't be where she is with her new business without having gone through RAMP. So you see all sorts of different paths people taking. Right. Interesting. There's probably people that have gone through RAMP, and I know this has happened uh, even with the Advancement Foundation, with the Gauntlet Program, where people get halfway through it with the mentoring, and they say, well, wait a minute. This is not what I should be doing, or I should be doing it in a different way. So I would imagine even when you were mentoring with RAMP that you might have helped steer people in a different direction, or it's nice to have another set of eyes on what you're doing. Yeah, and I think Mary would say this as well. We had one um, entrepreneur that came through, I want to say about three years ago, who was very passionate about the idea he had, the direction he was heading. He felt like he had some really good data that that was, that was the right thing. And what we teach and preach at RAMP largely is customer discovery. So we ask these technologists and scientists and researchers to go out and talk to people that you think are going to be your customers and find out what their, what their challenges are. Um, when he did this, he came back the first week and said, I don't have a business. Really? Yeah. And, um, and we mark this as a, as a success. We don't want anybody um, to waste time, energy, or money on something that's not going to be successful. And uh, he's, he is one of our success stories. He, he pivoted out of that path to starting a business into uh, healthcare space, which originally his original idea was going to be something to serve that space. Mm -hmm. But he's working in healthcare and doing very, very well. Mm -hmm. um, and again, he, he took the skill set he learned at RAMP. And innovation and entrepreneurship happens inside organizations. I'm sure it happens here mm -hmm. as well. So you need those people with an entrepreneurial mindset inside established businesses as well. Right. I always find that fascinating when people pivot and one of the reasons I really liked Factory Man by Beth Macy, which was about the Bassett family trying to step, stay one step ahead of the imports coming in from Malaysia and China and yep. furniture and how, you know, family run business, how they just pivoted, you know, kept light on their feet. And I was in manufacturing for a long time, which you have to do when you have competitors. So, um, yeah. so, so you really come into this, this job with, uh, with Ramp as the director with a, a really different insight, you know, as far as because you've been on the mentoring side of the business. Yeah, so I, I come in with a lot of different insights um, based on my experience. Actually, Beth Macy, who wrote Factory Man that you're referring to, um, she was a colleague of mine at my first job. So I worked at the Roanoke Times. Okay. I, I graduated. I worked there a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. I, so, um, so Beth and I were in the same newsroom at the time. Um, I graduated from Virginia Tech with a degree in liberal arts. Um, 
um, minor in business. And so I've, I've done a lot of different things. Most recently, the last decade or so, I've been working with um, tech translation, tech commercialization at the university level with the National Science Foundation, and a little bit as an independent contractor with um, the Korea Innovation Center, um, the U.S. State Department's program called Global Innovation Through Science and Technology. So the, the common theme throughout all of that is, is a, a little bit what Beth does, which is, and I had talked to her about this recently, and mm -hmm. she said, oh, it's Reporting 101, right? It's going out and building these relationships with people. It's, it's finding out what is really going on so that in manufacturing, as you mentioned, uh, we've, what have we had to do in the United States is pivot multiple times. We've right. got to figure out what's going to work here in our context in order to be successful. And sometimes the answer is, you know, what used to work just isn't going to work anymore, right? Right. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Um, and uh, what you were talking about, I think the translation and all that thing, is that, a, is that basically about taking bright ideas that happen in college and kind of get them over the commercial side, that type of thing? It is. There's a lot of great ideas, but can they be commercial and how do yeah. people get there? Yeah, so the National Science Foundation, our tax dollars, uh, get invested into universities uh, in, to the tune of billions of dollars. Congress, our representatives said, you know, we need to see more of what happens with that research come back out to the community in the marketplace. And so a, there was a, um, about 10 years ago, there was a program created called i mm -hmm. And so it's i for innovation hyphen C-O-R-P-S. And I've worked with that program for about six years. And the, the idea was to educate um, deep science technologists, uh, bench people, lab people that have great ideas and research, uh, intellectual property that's inside a university to help them see how could they take that to market and to figure out, is there any mm -hmm. business market commercial application for that intellectual property? Do the students get involved with the i program at all? Like if the, if the student hatches a great idea while they're in school? They do. So um, often at, at the student level in that program, you'd be talking about graduate students. Okay. So it would be somebody, the PI, the principal investigator, a faculty member who's got grad students working with him or her. They would be paired with the um, uh, business and industry mentor. And they go through i which is a 12-week program, um, as a team. And the uh, expectation is that they do 100 customer discovery interviews over the period of 12 weeks, which is a lot. Mm -hmm. um, we've had students, and actually one, one of the most successful um, stories we like to tell is about a young man who did 120 customer discovery interviews during the program, never slept one night in his bed. There's a grant that the NSF gives to those teams for travel. And so he was all over the United States pre-pandemic, of course, right? right? So a lot of it is virtual now, but still still the same thing. And what it, we've been doing a series here uh, with PBS and interviewing investors, um, funders for startups, and, and all of them say, we want to hear what customer data do you have? Who have you talked to out, right. you know? It, it can't be just a great idea that you think's a great idea and your parents think is a great idea and your colleagues. We've got to find out, d does anybody out in the market actually care about what you're selling? Right. So these students that were going out, were they, were they getting customer f potential customer feedback on something they had thought about or they had hatched? Um, sometimes, yes. And sometimes, you know, it's a team effort with a, with a principal investigator. And, and again, a, what's a little different about customer discovery and the way it's taught is you're, you're going out largely to the, the, uh, the potential markets and customer segments and asking them what's top of mind as, as far as problems that they're having and challenges. Mm -hmm. um, everybody has a rank order of criteria and things that are bothering them. Um, we, could, we often use an example when we're doing training around cell phones and smartphones. We're say, what are the top things that you don't like? about your cell phone. It doesn't matter what idea or app or, or feature that I have created, I wanna know what's top of mind. And then I need to know, are we on that list at all? So maybe the, the innovation or solution I have can solve the thing that's number 10 on your list. That's really not a business. We right. need to be up in the top three or four to really have something that somebody's gonna change their behavior or buy something. Right, you need, you need to get out of that silo. You can get stuck in that silo where you think you've got the best things in sliced bread. But it's probably pretty interesting when they get out in the field and somebody goes, oh, I already got that, or I got that here, or these yeah. people do it. 
Yeah, I was with one of my business partners. I was on a, um, a project that was being fed, uh, funded by the federal government, and they wanted to give us more money, and our competition for the technology we had, uh, which had to do with sensors for um, infants that were born premature, was fantastic. It could do a lot of things. Our competition, the solution that was currently being used, was a paper checklist, right? So you have this high-tech solution right. and this very simple process that was in place that was working for what it was. Um, uh, my business partner said, yeah, we're not taking the money. We can't beat the piece of paper because our, the sensors we had could not do all the things on the piece of paper checklist. We couldn't beat what they were already doing. Mm -hmm. And I was like, but they're right, they want to give us money, yeah. <laughs> right? That would fund me. Uh, but the answer was no. It, it, would there be a market for it? There Are people going to pay a bunch of money no. for something they can check off no. on paper? That's right. Yeah. The answer was no. So no. technically speaking, there were aspects we did better. And you have to be really careful when, a, when an entrepreneur or uh, you know, an inventor says, but I'm better. And it's like, you may define better, but to the people out here, is that a better solution? How did they define better? Mm -hmm. I'm wondering when, either when people are trying to get into the cohort or the, their candidates, um, are they doing patent searches or are you helping them with that to make sure that what, they're, what they've come up with is not, that there's some similar patent already in place? That's a, that's a relevant question because it has come up in the past. Mm -hmm. We don't do necessarily a lot of due diligence on patents as, as a regular thing, but we do have mentors and uh, volunteers that have dedicated leadership in the region that do work with folks around legal questions and that sort of thing. So it, it, so it does come up occasionally, but it is not a large focus of the, the staff of RAMP to be doing any sort of patent searches. You know, it's interesting going back to the whole entrepreneurial program at Tech and all that, that even in Roanoke Valley with a couple of liberal arts schools here, Hollins and Roanoke College, they both have instituted entrepreneurship programs. You know, you go to a liberal arts school, you go to Hollins or something, you study the arts or whatever, that they want to be able to indoctrinate you or show students, here's how you can possibly make money off of this, that type of thing. So, uh, and I know that... Um, Rono College has an entrepreneurship program too that so basically I think that's part of the whole thing of going to school is you can figure out what you want to do but also how you can make money so I think it's a good idea to get kids thinking about starting businesses growing businesses that type of thing no matter what they're going to school for yeah it's um it's something we like to help with at ramp as well in fact we're partnered with Virginia Western Community College and we'll be running a short course on entrepreneurship uh, next month for some of their students and we've done that in the past and Amy White uh, sure. who's, who's you probably know uh, said that the feedback for the last course that was done at ramp uh, from the students was I had no idea you know, I thought I was coming in, I was taking, I was going to get this kind of certificate or degree and that my only choices were this, this, and this. Mm. I never knew. So uh, entrepreneurship and, or an entrepreneurial mindset for students, whether they end up working inside a big company or starting some venture on their own, is a really important aspect, I think, of professional development to sure. understand you have options. Yeah, it's good if you want to be a product manager too, which is in high demand these days, pro yeah. product manager. Um, you're also the Vice President of Entrepreneurial Development. That's under the, the Verge umbrella. Talk about that and talk about what exactly Verge is as sort of a, a, a conglomeration of a couple of separate organizations. Yeah, so Verge is, um, has been a new iteration of the, the coalition or the alliance, as we like to call it, um, here in the region. So uh, we have RAMP, which is a, the leading program for all of Southwest Virginia for, uh, as a business accelerator for technology and biotechnology. Then we have RBTC that's, again, both under the um, parent organization, Verge, and the Roanoke Blacksburg Technology Council is the only one in the Commonwealth of Virginia, a tech council that is directly affiliated and connected to a business accelerator. So it creates this, um, <coughs> excuse me, it creates this soft landing space for anybody in technology to both be associated with um, startup and entrepreneurial uh, work going on at the same time they have these colleagues that are all focused on technology. Um, and again, Verge, the overarching organization, we work to build coalitions with all the entities in the region that affect uh, economic development around tech translation, tech commercialization, and we all know that some of those players include the Fralin Biomedical Research Institute here in Roanoke, 
Carillion, Virginia Tech, and Blacksburg, the scientists and researchers in that space, economic developers uh, like Mark Nelson here in the city of Roanoke, Amy White at Virginia Western Community College. Um, the work that you're seeing in this, in this small uh, space at the Gill Memorial Building with RAMP and RBTC and Verge touches so many, so many, many other spaces and places. It takes, it takes hundreds of people to make the kind of impact we're making. It's not, it's not four or five people or 10, it's, it's hundreds. Right, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the RBTC members, some of them act as mentors Absolutely. in the RAMP program mm -hmm. for, the, for the cohort members. They do. Yeah, and I know that uh, like Mark Nelson likes to talk about the entrepreneurial ecosystem here. Yeah. You know, the Frayland Biomedical Research Institute, you know, they're looking to put a, a shared lab space in place. Yep. Same thing down at the uh, Corporate Research Center. Yeah, um, it's being built out right now. Right. Um, we just hired somebody that's going to work with us with the space you're talking about here in Roanoke, that startup studio that's going to be there. That's a partnership with Johnson & Johnson's J-Labs program. RAMP is working directly with uh, J-Labs to make sure that biotech, very early stage uh, biotech entrepreneurs will be ready to apply and be a part of the J-Labs program, which is very well funded and very well regarded mm -hmm. internationally. And of course, Johnson & Johnson they develop one of the COVID, COVID vaccines. So are they looking to get in there and basically give these uh, programs or whatever they're working on a head start on, on, on They do, on. and they do have focus areas, m much like the Commonwealth of Virginia has said, these are the assets that we have from a technological and an intellectual asset uh, map, landscape across the uh, Commonwealth of Virginia. For instance, we focus on autonomous systems is one of our areas where we excel. Um, Johnson and Johnson and J Labs have specific areas that they want to focus as well. So, so they do have focus areas, and they're looking to to support that kind of early stage work. Mm -hmm. You know, I was looking at the latest cohort, which is going to have their demo day in December. Um, it, it's kind of all 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 over the map. Uh, I thought one one was interesting was the um, a company that wants to help uh, work on a technology that could help create a chain of battery manufacturers in the U.S. Kind of uh, fill in that supply chain. That sounds like a really neat idea. It is. Um, I, I love the impetus for what they're doing. So um, everybody knows that the political landscape has been always changing, right? But it seems even more disrupted in, in recent years, um, which has disrupted supply chains. What we can import and export in the United States has shifted quite a great deal. There's uh, I, hundreds if not thousands of pickup trucks right now in the United States that people are buying and they're sitting there and they're waiting on one part. A chip. As, yeah, right. as soon as that gets there, they can put it in and you can have your truck, right? The, we've never had that situation really in the United States before. So Fermi Energy, the company that you're referencing in the current cohort, um, is intellectual property that's been developed at Virginia Tech. These two founders are, um, one is a faculty member at Virginia Tech. And the thought there was we are very dependent for um, electric vehicle batteries that are created uh, with raw materials out of China. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they've come up with a, um, a way to create electric vehicle batteries here in the United States using raw materials that we can easily source without being dependent on uh, countries outside the United States. Right. I think it's interesting and I think, uh, I think really for many years until COVID laid everything bare, we, we sort of took for granted, okay, we can get this cheap from China or Taiwan or Didn't India. Didn't we? Yeah. Very, you know, and then really COVID, you know, and that's really a lot of the reasons for the inflation is this, this the, yeah. you know, there's, there's a shortage of people making this stuff. And, mm -hmm. you know, Congress has passed the CHIPS Act, which could mean um, chip factories built in the U.S. Be kind of neat if they came out of ramp, the battery technology yeah. people, and they set up shop here in Southwest Virginia, huh? Yeah. Yeah, and we just don't know, right? We don't know what, what the future holds. And um, this reminds me, we, we worked with entrepreneurs uh, out of, you know, or I have, you know, uh, I say we, some other people mm -hmm. I work with, not RAMP specifically, but we've worked with um, entrepreneurs from universities all across the United States um, who come up with these ideas based on regulations they think are going to happen or they believe eventually these things will happen, which is really not, not a great way to build a business because you never know what the politi political landscape's going to be. Right. But in this case, um, this is, you know, it's like a dependence on oil or something, right? It's very clear that 
the more energy independent this nation can be, the stronger that we're going to be. Just, um, just well, you're not beholden to the whims of other countries or whatever, right? Yeah, or or supply chains or those kinds of things. So um, this is something that's been touted in the United States in a variety of spaces for a long, long time. Um, but right now, this is the near term thing that's happening that that people can relate to, right? Mm -hmm. I think I heard something this morning uh, that you know the. The energy crisis and the higher energy prices and all that, uh, which hopefully is fairly temporary, but it is really pushing more momentum towards alternative energy sources, that type yeah. of thing. Yeah, it is. And um, I work with some folks internationally and uh, I have a friend in, in Poland and the UK that I work with and some others. And, you know, to hear what they're going through um, and realizing we could be right in that space at some point as well. Um, you know, I, the United States is um, much more diverse in, in where we can get things than some of the smaller countries. But, um, you know, we, we could be facing similar crises. Mm -hmm. You know, I wanted to bring up something. You work, you, you've done work down, you're from Blacksburg, you've done work there. Uh, Ramp is here. Uh, it, it would just seem that if there was some way to draw the talent from the two valleys closer together, you know, we're, uh, you know, it seems like they're almost two s separate valleys. But do you see that there is more work between the two valleys? Yeah, I, and I have to credit, um, again, all those people that, that have brought things to where they are today. Um, Aaron Bertram, the president of Verge, has, has really uh, done a great job beating that drum and, and saying, you know, this, this work is about coalition building and collaboration. And, you know, I'll point back to the National Science Foundation right now. Ramp and Verge are part of... Uh, two NSF engines proposals that are going out and the National Science Foundation, these are big, big uh, grant opportunities, but the National Science Foundation has put out to the United States, we want to see, we're willing to put hundreds of millions of dollars into uh, startup and science and technology commercialization if we see that you are working across wide geographic footprints with a variety of organizations Interesting. that are under-resourced. Um, so, you know, from the top down, we are being told and, said, in, and being encouraged, get together people, work across geographic boundaries. Mm -hmm. So we are seeing more and more, the Roanoke and the New River Valleys working together. Um, we're seeing more and more physical assets that are connected, right? So you have here in Roanoke, we have many things that belong to Virginia Tech right. or were founded by Virginia Tech. And that really has helped draw the two valleys it has, together. It yeah. has, The FBRI and the medical school. Yeah, right. absolutely. Um, you know, and I've been commuting back and forth a lot between uh, Roanoke and Blacksburg. And, you know, it's always busy. That route is always busy. I know. It's, I moved down here over 25 years ago. 81 is a lot busier than it, it used to It is a lot busier, right? It is a lot busier. In fact, there's a, um, I was just talking to somebody last night at, um, Science on Tap, I believe, is the, the, the event that was in Blacksburg. And um, we were talking about ways to talk about innovation in the region mm -hmm. uh, with a leadership group. And there's, a, there's an activity called the Startup Bus. That's, you'll have to look it up. It's a fun thing. And I was thinking we should do a Startup Bus using the Smartway Bus. Sure. You know, between Roanoke and Blacksburg. You get a group of people on the bus. They go a certain distance. And during that time that they're on the bus, they come up with ideas and pitches for businesses. Oh, that's a great idea. I almost think the train, when it comes, is going to help too. Yep. Go back and forth, get it. If there's a connection to tech from the train, I really think that's going to help because, you know, look, in New York or Boston, San Francisco, it's not unusual to be on the road for an hour commuting with yep. traffic and distance. But uh, here, it is that sometimes that topography, Hitting up, heading up Christiansburg Mountain. I think it some, puts an impediment sometimes. Well, it's what people are used to, right, and familiar with. And I, I do think that the big um, coalition building aspect to all of this is how much time people spend together, right? And, and it's any, I think what you're speaking to is how easy can we make it? How much fr friction can we take out of the system sure. so people can spend time together? I think um, there's, there's so many things that RBTC does to bring people together in a common space. Um, Tech Night this last year was record crowd. We had over 400 people. The RBTC drew in for that event. And, you know, no matter where I was, if I was talking to somebody or walking through that crowd, you could hear people saying, oh, my gosh, it's so good to be back in person. It's so good to see people. Yeah, it is. Right. So I think we're craving that. And at the same time, I think we're a little nervous about being back in, in person or 
we're more inclined to say, ah, I could just do that on Zoom. Yeah, and I think we, find, we have found ways to use Zoom where it's still applicable. Absolutely. And I know the politicians have Tim Kaine and Mark Warner do pressers like almost yep. every week on Zoom. They never did that before. Have about a minute left. I'm just wondering, um, just to sum up, do you, do you see, Lisa, momentum building? in the valley, in the ecosystem, this entrepreneurial ecosystem where the, you know, things could bust out. Yeah, you can feel it. Like the energy, it's like the flywheel effect, right? It's, it's, you spin a little and spin a little and then it gets, this, it gets this momentum and then all of a sudden it takes off, right? Um, you can feel it happening and I, you know, I feel within the next 12 to 24 months, you know, those, those core people are feeling, those core organizations are seeing it and feeling and then that's gonna ripple out. You know, it's gonna become, so apparent to the people that are not directly touching it. Like, wow, what happened? That feels like an overnight change. But it's been going on for years, right? All right, sounds good. Lisa Garcia with uh, Ramp and Verge. We're going to have to leave it there. But Lisa, thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me. I'm Gene Morano. This has been Business Matters. Have a good day.